Am I the first thing you touch in the morning? very motivating to do something new, something that no one ever did before, and to set new rules of telling a story. How do we make new filmic language? Look down at your feet. Yeah. Wonderful, come on. Today there is a third meeting of, of, of the project Digital Presence, and our guest today is Horan Direct, a musician and founder of the Smartphone Orchestra, uh, Steja Halema. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, the sun is shining in Holland, and uh, the weather is beautiful, so mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I think Ukraine must be very beautiful. In your biography on the smartphone orchestra website and LinkedIn, you, uh, uh, or at least text, mentions that you are son of a uh, well-known magician. Yeah, how does it influence your life? Uh, what was the childhood of a son of a magician? Well, I guess one of my one of the biggest magic tricks that my father pulled off was. Um, making himself disappear to Spain when I was five. <laughs> so my father was, was, um, wasn't really there, which obviously greatly influenced my life. But, um, uh, but so in that sense, it doesn't really influence me that, that much because before that, I don't think I even knew what magic was. I, I have pictures of myself though, that I'm doing magic at school. So I have like the high hat and the ropes and the magic stick and everything. Um, but I've always been all very proud of my father that he did something so special and creative and imaginative. So, although I wasn't not necessarily like very fond of my father, not because I didn't like him, but because I didn't know him, I, I was, I was, on the opposite, proud that he was very creative. And that is something that, that has formed my identity in, 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 a, in a great way. And now I'm older and I made a lot of work. I feel that I am trying to do magic, but in another way. I think that's why I first tried, to, tried it with doing music because I thought maybe my father is a magician, but I want to become a wizard. And I think music is magic, like it's real magic, you know, it, you, you don't see anything, you know, you put music on, you don't see anything and everyone feels something, which is like, I think, wow, this is, this is amazing. So, uh, and then at a certain point, I thought that music is always interesting, but it's, it's hard making a living in music. And it's also very institutionalized, I think, music. So it's hard to be a really innovative artist in music. You know, it's, 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 if you do something new, people don't really understand that because they really think in the old ways of music, it's, it's a genre and it's, you're a rock star or whatever, you know, there's, it's changing at the moment very much with like Spotify and how we listen to music, but, but the icons, the stars, they are kind of the same still, although with influencers and stuff, it changes a little bit, but, so at a certain point, I didn't find that so interesting. And to, to sell my music, I was always trying to come up with something special, which was mostly something doing with media, like making a 360 video or um, <clears throat> a smartphone orchestra kind of thing. And, that, and, and now, now when, I, when I'm a little bit older and, and, and made some sort of body of work, I think... Um, uh, I think I am very much like my father. 
in the sense that I am trying to create wonder in the world, make people, inspire people with something like, oh, wow. But I do it differently though than my father because my father, he toured the whole world on his own. You know, he, he was traveling the whole world on the stage, doing his magic, going off stage alone, like being this monkey with a trick, if, if I say that. Like, I don't want to be disrespectful to my father, but just to give the image a clearer picture. Um, and this is something I really don't want. So I think that's what I'm trying to do with the smartphone orchestra. So the smartphone orchestra is not about me as an artist at all. It's about everyone. So, so that was very liberating for me also after being a musician, because also being a musician, you're kind of pushed into this role of being this, this star that's standing on stage and is doing something that is really, really cool, you know? And, and I, f I found that so narrowing and, and boring, actually. Uh, and maybe I wasn't good at it. That could also be the case, obviously. But, um, but with the smartphone orchestra, the smartphone orchestra is for everyone. You know, everyone can, can be part of the thing. It's not about me being brilliant or anything. It's about us being together, sharing this experience, which I think is way cooler than the egotistic uh, icons that uh, last century was full of. One of the uh, aspects of this uh, is that you make visible. It's also kind of uh, magic, but but yeah, but uh, different. There were different elements that make visible camera, make visible is this transition, and uh, yeah, it's. It, I, I watch it with a big interest on a flat screen, despite yeah, usually it's hard to, to observe 360 on a flat screen, but mm. you make it uh, in a way that it, it, it works for me. Yeah, I think, I think what you are hinting at is, is what I really like is, again, like it's interesting that you started with magic because I'm, I'm a lot of times I'm doing the opposite of my father. Actually, I like my father, like how the trick works, you don't show it. But I actually really like to show the trick and how much effort is being done to make the trick work. So I, I think that's actually really cool that you are like if someone is putting a hula hoop over your your over the camera, but over you in VR. And that that is changing you into something else. Although that is magic, definitely in VR, you also see how it is done, kind of thing. And I think I think seeing a lot of people work for you is is something really special. That's because I think that's why I also like I'm a big fan, for example, of OK Go. You know, OK Go, the band and their music videos. Like I love that. I love that so much. I uh, I I would I would kill to make a, a VR music video for OK Go. That would be like my dream. Uh, yeah, so you are now combining a smartphone orchestra and also VR uh, filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, mm, and uh, yes, uh, uh, about uh, your ba background, because it's mentioned that you study music, fine art, dance, also work on TV. My background also kind of diverse. And sometimes I feel it as ah oh, like what 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 need I do what I like most, and uh, <laughs> you feel that anxiety. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, this uh, VR, for example, I feel yeah here you could do it. it's par partly theater, partly fil film, and uh, yeah, it's also with the computer science. Uh, so how you do you feel uh, 
Uh, United. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I think it's a good question. I feel that anxiety because I always wanted to do everything. You know, it's like I, there's so many ah, you know, that creative spark can also give you fear in the sense of like, how am I going to do all of this? So I kind of like calm myself with um, narrowing it down to a certain uh, um, um, yeah, I would say my craft. And my craft is actually very simple. What I, what, what I am specializing in is the relationship between the player spectator and the story. So for example, in VR, you are part of the story because you are there. So that's why I like VR so much. Also with the smartphone orchestra, you as the, the listener, spectator, participant, you are part of it. So all my work is about that relationship. And, and that allows me to do many different things, but it's, it's that what I'm doing. And that's what I'm trying to do as good as possible. Because I feel that this is something that we, we need to figure out this century. Like last century, you figured out to put everything in a square and then cut and make that super engaging and empath empathetic. And now we need to figure out how can, we, how can we make stories where the participants are part of it. Um, and and, uh, and 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 we're still figuring that out like like computer games are doing it in a way but it's very simple until now it's either you know you either you're like you you're hunting on something you know and it's just violence or you uh, or you have like a short scene in which you can choose you know what the questions are um and i think vr like is is, is this an ar is this box where we can like find ways that that moves much more organic and uh, we, we could uh, talk about more precisely uh, on a uh, well datum. This is VR Opera game. Hi, welcome to the inside of your own body. You're actually never here, are you? We are going to explore it together. Just put your hands on your belly, underneath your belly button. This is the beginning of everything. Do you feel that? Now it is time to start making real sounds. But for sound, you need foundation, like a floor, a floor to put your own feet on. Look down at your feet. Yeah. Wonderful, come on. Yeah. Work on that foundation. Just try different pitches. kleurde kringen eromheen. Ja, dat was echt heel gaaf. Die bril was het uh, bijna het heelal met uh, allemaal sterren en, en cirkels wat, wat dus bewoog. En uh, als je dus uh, je stem liet horen, dan uh, werden die cirkels en die, 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 die figuren werden dus daardoor versterkt. We were asked by an opera house and a theater, co theater collective to collaborate on a virtual reality opera. And um, 
it should be an opera about a little bit about opera and they had they had, they actually had quite a bit of money <laughs> so i was interested you know i'm an artist you know i need to work and um uh, and uh and but at a certain point I, you know i i don't really like opera i like opera in the sense that I think it's a beautiful craft, but but just people that sing like really loud, loud, loud. like I, if I hear that on the radio, I turn it off. You know, it's, it's too like it's. I rather listen to heavy metal to, than to see people going like ah, like that. But I kind of appreciate the the craftsmanship and the sportsmen. You know, like an opera singer or singeress is like they're amazing sports people. So that's what I find interesting. So. A little bit obnoxious i said like why don't we make it about like the singer you know about singing and and uh, and and maybe we could like teach the audience how to sing and uh, and well like i apparently i had enough authority in that creative conversation that they were like okay let's try that then and uh, and then we tried it and and it worked out beautifully so what we do is it's a piece for 60 people and they come into the opera venue and it's actually a circle and 30 of them sit down and the, the other 30 get to wear a headset a virtual reality headset and uh and they are guided by 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 actually other people who are a choir as well and really good opera singers and then in this virtual reality headset they are playing a game a game that teaches them how to sing so they're learning how to sing by the having to breathe in a certain way. And we had this like interactive thing that you have to do to, to sing the right pitch. You know, you, you had this like kind of thing that went up and down like a tuner kind of thing. And so we let those people do that, but all the headsets are synchronized. So um, uh, the, 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 they, the 30 people with the headsets become a choir and standing around the people that are sitting and looking at it. And so they become a choir, they sing, and actually people sing really good if they're helped. It's really interesting, like we're all so musical. And then after 10 minutes, the, 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 they swapped. So the other half of the audience got to wear the headset and then the last half minutes, the opera singers really sing. And what I really liked about this process is that when I was experiencing it, at the last 10 minutes, I was looking at those opera singers singing beautiful, and now I love opera. <laughs> You know, I cured my own problem with this project. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, yeah. So it still exists? Uh, it, it still exists, um, but it, it has proven, and this was 2016 that we made it, it has proven to, uh, to be very hard to um, distribute. Like, like, like people want it, but then like the singers and the headsets and, um, I kind of have to blame the opera house that hire, hired us a little bit that they don't see. It's not in their interest to really sell it because they already did what they needed to do. And I, 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 I'm a bit bitter about that because I felt like that piece could have toured the whole world and everyone would have gone like, this is insane, this is so good. And, um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, at a certain point, I couldn't be the one selling it because, you know, I'm busy already with other stuff and we we did try really hard but it proved so difficult <laughs> that uh but it's still there so like please try it try, I, I will always try again to play it somewhere because i think it's a really really good piece mm -hmm. yes this question of distribution uh yeah for such uh, yeah, in a way site specific work because you need uh, opera singers and yeah chorus to have uh and uh, yeah mm -hmm. Uh, even why the uh, 360 and VR, if you don't have headsets, then you are kind of uh, yeah, disconnected from the full full immersion or, or at least mm -hmm. uh, is this. Uh, but yeah, so you uh, work on Disney yeah, in some Disney VR startup. Uh, ah, yeah. Well, no, it's 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 not Disney. It was um, it was Jaunt uh, XR. Jaunt was a startup from uh, from uh, Silicon Valley in uh, LA, an American startup, and they were funded by Disney. Mm -hmm. So uh, Disney saw like was interested in okay virtual reality, interesting. So they they 
help this startup try to develop that as good as possible. That was a that was a very uh, interesting and wild ride for me. I uh, I made the music video you mentioned earlier. The, the what do we care for? Um, when I was making that video, I personally, when I was working on it, I didn't know what virtual reality was then. It was while I was working on it on the script and doing tests that I discovered the Oculus, the DK2, uh, still then. Uh, it was 2014, like maybe summer 2014, on a blog. And I was kind of like, hmm, wait a second. So I could like put that headset and then I can look around in my own music video. And I already had test material. So I, I, I bought that headset without telling my producer because I, I thought I could never convince him. I wasn't sure, you know, I thought like, I need to try this. So, and, um, uh, and then I, I, it took me two weeks or something to make it work on my computer, like for, for I finally understood how it kind of worked. And then I, I put my test material in and I had the headset on. And instead of looking at my material, I was standing in my own music video and it was like, what? I was really, I was really blown away by, by this. And then I changed the whole script and made it about transitions, you know, the hula hoop thing. And so I made that music video, but I also made it because I, I was already like back in 2009, I was already doing 360 video, it's just like how you watched my music video, like scrolling on YouTube. And, um, uh, um, uh, and, and, and I'm, so, so when that, that music video came out, it was like perfectly timed with, uh, with the hype that VR was. And then uh, eventually the, the CTO of John saw it and he went like, I want that guy. So they flew me over to LA and, uh, and, and Silicon Valley. And they said like, we want you to work for us as a, as a, to make VR. And I said like, mm, let me think about it. Okay, I say yes. <laughs> and that was, uh, was very interesting. It was very commercial, which is very different from what I, uh, what I, what I did before. But that also was very interesting just to, that, that really put my own art, artistic work in a perspective you know like hey wait a second how does the rest of the world think about what is good and what is worth something so uh, i i'm not sure if i always agree with the commercial uh, way of looking but um it was at least very interesting to uh, to uh, to learn and i i got to make a lot as well which was really cool um my, my impression is that the the active time or the everything as a waves, but uh, now, uh, despite of yeah, Facebook, Oculus, uh, a, a lot of efforts, but there are no yeah, any big, uh, uh, yeah, go, going further, any, any revolution in the, in the content. Yeah, your, your video clip, it's, yeah, it's uh, like very, very more than yeah, very high, high peak of videos that that you could gain from from sixty, uh, yeah. and uh, yes, uh, and in in this way, uh, smartphone orchestra in the way of engaging people, it seems for me even more effective. Uh, what was your way to come yeah from? From, from music, from 360 to smartphone orchestra to, to, to work with people, uh, phones. Yeah, well, it was not, like I didn't go from VR to phones. It was more parallel. It was kind of like the same time that I was making the 360 video. I, the, the, the idea for, for the smartphone orchestra came in 2013, I think, and I was still doing a lot of music at the time. And I was kind of starting to get fed up with trying to be a musician and trying to make that work. And, um, and I was a friend of mine who is a set designer. He makes set pieces for theater and stuff. He actually was still studying and he, he made a really cool uh, decor. He had 40 really big helium balloons filled with helium. So they were floating like weather balloons. And he put speaker, speakers underneath them. But the, because he didn't know anything about sound, he had just one mono like signal going to them and just connected them all together. And I saw it, I was like, I was like, dude, I'm gonna make music for this. This is awesome. So I got all his 40 speakers 
I like from everywhere, I got amplifiers and I, at a certain point I had 10 amplifiers. So I had 10 different groups with speakers and I started experimenting with, uh, with that. And that was, as a musician, it was really liberating to not having to make music for two speakers, but for my whole ceiling was full of speakers. Actually, what you see here on the, on the that, those are actually all speakers here. This, this is like the, the, the thing I made after that to be able to, to do this. So all the black cubes are, are really tiny, shitty speakers. Could you, um, yeah, I could see. But, but, but to finish the story, the, 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 so I was, I was making this music or soundscapes and, and in my studio, and I would love it so much. I would like make this soundscape that was coming from all directions. I would close my door and I would go home and uh, the next day I would come back and I would just like step into this sea of sound and music and it was so beautiful. And at the same time, I was taking the train and, and that was like by 2013, like the whole world was kind of having a smartphone and was zomb zombified. They were all zombies and just looking at their smartphone in the train only. No human contact anymore. And that, that was when I saw like, wait a second, there's a speaker in those phones. And via the internet, we must be able to uh, to synchronize these phones in one way or the other. So that was like a real ping in my head, like this classic Eureka that you go like, oh, what the fuck? Sorry for my language. I need to make this. And to, then I uh, applied for an art fund and uh, they gave me some money and I made a prototype and it worked. And then, uh, well, th then the idea was so new that that it uh, that that yeah we're actually we're still the only ones who do this really well. It's kind of like at a certain point you had a couple of groups that were trying to do it, but uh, I think they all made mistakes in uh, in in their approach. Either they try to be too musical to make it really an instrument that everyone needs to play, or by making it too difficult or by wanting too much. And I think why, this, why the smart, our smartphone orchestra really works is because we focus on two things. First, it's really accessible. It's not an app. You know, you just go to the browser and everyone can participate. So it's really, you can really spontaneously be part of the smartphone orchestra. And also we keep it very light for data. So it always works. You know, we keep our functionality small, but we make sure it really works. And we, always like create an experience like a real story that you are part of which which makes it engaging uh a rust project according to smartphone orchestra website is a persistence of memory yeah in my uh, last months and there were 400 phones with symphony orchestra but yeah but how exactly it was connected and Tarham. Well, that, that was not the last project, but that mm -hmm. could be, I need to revisit my site, that's clear. Um, the, 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 how it was connected. Um, well, like people log into their phones and then the piece starts playing on their phones, but to make sure that the, the orchestra and the phones are in time, the conductor plays with a click track. So he has, he has the partiture, like just the piece, his stick or her stick in our case, 
and 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 uh, and a click track. So the click track also changes tempo sometimes, but she follows that. So the orchestra is in sync with the with the, with the music on the phones because humans are easily can more easily adapt to things than machines. Uh, so uh, and I as a visitor, uh, I could uh, listen music from my phone, from the orchestra, and from other. No, humans. no. The, the the music the music from the orchestra is real is the is the real instruments. Like in a really good orchestra hall, there's no amplification. You know, the room and the acoustic instruments. This is the sound. So. The, the 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 music from the phones is uh, is electronic parts that blend with the mm. with the music of the orchestra. So the blend is in the sky. You know, uh, are, we are back at why music is magic. You don't see anything. You know, it's it's everywhere and it's magic. So like the vibrating violin makes the air vibrate and the phones make the air vibrate and together they are the magic. <laughs> uh yeah i could imagine it and uh, um yeah i have a personal experience uh, with uh, the smartphone orchestra at uh, itfa in 2019 and uh, it was also a great experience for me yeah where uh, we were uh, yeah 100 uh, participants we were connected and yeah social sorting experiment the title of the work mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, yeah, so some this hidden mechanism yeah, when uh, technology uh, kind of uh, is sorting or yeah, re revealing some, uh, some patterns in, in human society. Now, maybe you've read or heard about the internet, but you're still not exactly sure what it is. It spans the globe like a superhighway. But simply, the internet is just a network of networks. Okay guys, the first thing that you need to know is that the internet is amazing and it's changing every day. No one owns the internet. The social sorting experiment came out of our real realization. Uh, maybe it's good to mention that the smartphone orchestra is not only me. We are a team of, uh, of like, I'm the creative director, but we have an extremely creative coder and extremely creative composer, sound designer that, that makes the pieces next uh, together with me. Um, but uh, while we were exploring the, the musical potential of the, of the smartphone orchestra, we realized that the, there might be a bigger potential. And that's the potential of telling a story, not to the audience, like we're used to, but with the audience. Like we can, like the, the, the smartphone can make a sound and maybe you can tap something that makes a sound or sw swipe something that makes a sound. But if you change the phone into something that gives the human an instruction, the phones become the partiture and 
the, the humans are the instrument. And so we can give them instructions. So we, we were really about like, hmm, but what sort of story can we then tell with people? And, and also we can ask people stuff via the phones and, and, and use that data to progress the story. So, so th that was around 2017 that I was really thinking about this, no, 16 even, when the, the uh, I, I don't know if you heard about the Facebook, Facebook scandal with Cambridge Analytica. Yeah, yeah, sure. That was a big thing, you know, apparently it, it, it changed the, the outcome of Brexit and the, the election of, of Trump in, a, well, I think uh, maybe in hindsight in a smaller way, but, but still it, it did influence it, it and it was at, at least it was a new way of manipulating audiences, which I think is uh, something that should not happen. So, but when I heard about it, that, that they are mapping the, 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 all the users of Facebook and then can manipulate them to, to, to choose something. I thought like, this is the story we need to tell. And we have like the perfect tool in, in our hands. You know, you can be part of how this network ordens you. So, so that's why we came up with the social sorting experiment, which in essence is just people are in the venue on a grid. And then we ask them to rate each other on really various topics. Like who has more beautiful ears? Who would I rather donate a kidney to? Who um, would I rather have babysit my two-year-old daughter? And, and by asking all these questions, we can put the people in order of the ratings they, they made themselves. And, and that's when you feel that, that by just giving all the data, you actually hand out power over you to some, to some entity you don't even know what they're gonna do with it. So this is the story we're telling with the social sorting experiment. And I think I really like, like, like it because I think it's, it's a very urgent story. It's a story that needs to be told. And, and we told, tell it with, with the form that it's actually happening. So you and your phone, swiping away all the data and you're slowly you're being mapped and being manipulated and so you present this work at a different uh, countries a different places yeah that's yeah. correct uh yeah. and being uh, on the side of this power yeah, people who who could see uh yes yeah, be, be behind this uh, experiments and sorting uh, do you find, uh, do you have some insights? Uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, uh, you apply to different uh, groups to, in different countries. Was it working the same? Like humans are the same or, or, uh, or is there was any differences? Uh, the, I think that the, the most interesting insight is that there's not too many, inter not too many differences. Um, First and foremost, I, I really believe that the humans are much more the same than we are different. But 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 also like how the how the story came across was really the same in the sense that in every country this is a story that's happening, you know. All the social media is everywhere. But we didn't play in China, which is maybe kind of a different story, but maybe like the only thing that that I, that really got my attention is that people in, in Asia are more polite than in Europe. <laughs> like they, like when they had to face each other, you know, like you have like, and they like in Europe, they all just follow the instructions, but in Asia, they, they, they all first like introduce themselves neatly to each other, which I thought was, was nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in, in this way, uh, yeah, we're going to next to judgment day, that mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you uh, was it for you a way to overcome lockdown and this impossibility to meet personally? <laughs> you could say that, yeah, I think so. I think it well, like when lockdown happened, all of a sudden we were looking at each other's Zoom rooms, and there was a way to connect. So, uh, f first we tried to translate the social sorting experiment to Zoom which actually works it, it kind of still the story is still there but it's because you're not really close to each other there's not that friction between being with real people and the network with which you judge you know which i think is a strong element so we thought like hmm, maybe we can use the same mechanics and then 
go a bit deeper and, and also use like that there's something actually really special that you can look into each other's living rooms. Well, I cannot now with you because it's blurred. It's already interesting that people get, like the, the Zoom gives you this option, you know, that you can blur your background. So there's some other intimacy that all opens while we cannot look, be close to each other. And my hope for Judgment Date was how can I, how can we um, use that new intimacy to break through bias and prejudice? And personally, I don't think Judgment Date was very good. It was really a research thing. We were in the research uh, uh, thing. And um, uh, I, I felt that we were fighting too many battles at the same time. We were trying to make a piece about bias, and that, which is basically an enemy, which is in all of us. While the social sorting, we had the big tech companies, Facebook, you know, those are, those are the enemy. That's a much easier story to tell than, oh, wait a second, no, there's an enemy in you, you know, like, who are we to tell you? you know? So that's that's difficult. Although I believe that our that our, that our intentions were sincere and good, it's it's just more difficult. And at the same time, we're trying to uh, do this on Zoom, so we had to control the whole Zoom meeting, and we had to like make the sort of make sure the system worked on the phones as well in that context. So, uh, like I I thought it was a really interesting experiment, but I wish I had had more time and more money to really do it because it was it was it was difficult and and also i i would really like to uh, work together with a uh, university in psychology to really have hard scientific data to work on instead of me as an artist like trying to find all my intuitions and well i read a lot you know but still i make my own selection of the books i read and then i try to make chocolate out of that and i think it would be good to have I collaborate for this piece i would really like to collaborate with um harder science yeah uh, about politeness and uh, being crude uh, i can see that in uh, in this judgment that there are a combination yeah, you have this limitation of time and you need to judge you need yeah, to make some stereotypic uh, decision and and then you have uh, this peer-to-peer -peer experience with a person and uh, questions that you propose to discuss they are so intimate and sincere and and uh, I, I feel because of the uh, presenters that it's a space and in a way it's working as yeah, in some old time uh, I don't know at least uh, in Ukraine, there, there is a phrase that you could tell everything some, uh, some, some person in a train because you believe that you wouldn't meet anymore. So you could be honest to, yeah, to, to yeah, completely, yeah. completely unknown person. And, and yeah. here in Zoom, uh, uh, in, in some way, yeah, it was it answers this effect. Yeah, oh, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's opening up to a stranger. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. If we are in a community, then yeah, is this uh, another, uh, is this offline uh, uh, life would also affect. But but here yeah, I see this person from uh, from London or from India, and there are, maybe because they are so interested in such technology, we could meet, but. Yeah, yeah, I feel I feel very safe and yeah, uh, the, ah, this cool. sh shyness is disappearing. Yeah, that's good. It's interesting what you say that that if you are in a in a because when we did the social sorting experiment, also it also work it always works better with strangers. That's like we we did it also for companies, you know, like because they pay money and then we can make what we want. And then, then they, because in, in companies, people are less honest about each other. So the hierarchy is there. So no one's going to like misjudge the boss, you know, or maybe some countries. But so, uh, so I, I always thought it was less strong in, 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 in communities or contexts where people knew each other a little bit better. It, it works much better if people are strangers. Then, then it's like, then it's the truth, actually, instead of the social construct.
I have always been a vessel for other people's voices, but this is my voice. My one voice now become many. Am I the first thing you touch in the morning? Am I nice, shiny and soft? Please stroke my glassy front down your cheek. And now down your other cheek. Am I warm? Am I making your face warm? Keep stroking my screen. I too need constant stimulation. As you ache for me, I ache for you. Yeah, well, work, I love work. I work is, is uh, really cool. Work was actually the first uh, thing when we tried to um, uh, make uh, the smartphone orchestra like to give instructions to the audience instead of just passive listening. Um, now work, we, we did that in 2017 uh, together with them, also at IFA. And uh, it's really about, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, about how technology is changing how we deal with each other in a way that's that's kind of like that's a big theme in all our pieces obviously um and and work is just this really fun cool thing and enneagram is amazing and they're so funny so i love that piece i can send you another video maybe later like we did it in uh like that was actually a really intimate setting it was in in at south by southwest but we were kind of at a Sort of gathering of, uh, of of all XR creators, um, and we did it. And we are in this villa, and Rene Penel, who's like the the, the big dude from uh, from um, uh, uh, what's it called again, uh, Kaleidoscope. He was hosting it, uh, and we were way too wild, wild as a, as a crowd. So now he's not never allowed on Airbnb anymore because we messed it up for him. Um, but, uh, but then, like, all these creative people sing together in that living room. It's really beautiful. I'll send you that video. You, you like And then you get what, what work really is. <laughs> that, that's, I think, a, a good idea. Uh, yeah, uh, great. And, um, yeah, I have uh, a couple of more questions. And uh, we are uh, across to one hour. Uh, and one is, yeah, as, as I understand, you're most appreciated by, by audience and awards, uh, VR work is Ashes to Ashes. Yes, it's a tragic comedy uh, in 360. Okay, clear the set, please. Action. Ashes to Ashes is a, a project where three directors, a theater director, a movie director, and a VR director, uh, are directing the same script. The story is that there's this sort of dysfunctional family and uh, their grandpa has just died. And grandpa has a very weird wish. He wants his ashes to be blown up. Of course, the family is a little bit confused to do that. And then the set breaks open, and there's another story taking place. I think the big challenge we took upon us is that we are doing a one actor. It's a 10 minute film in one shot, so we basically choreographed a dance for about 40 people. I think it's very motivating to do something new, something that no one ever did before, and to set new rules of telling a story. How do we make new filmic language? How do we progress a story when the viewer is free to look wherever he wants? How do we grab his attention? How VR works is that you look around in a space that sort of your brain thinks is there, uh, you can fill it with things that are not able to happen. So we really push that boundary of how um, yeah, the viewer relates to reality at the end.
after after this film uh, it, yeah it was four years ago if i if i write yes you you done it and for these four years what changes uh, you feel happens or, or in in this uh, industry is it any new uh, possibilities uh big changes like ashes the ashes was made in 2016 it came out in 17. i think 2016 was the hype of vr and that was a lot a lot of it was um was 360 video um i think i i love as as i think as is as is a really like classy made like very high quality uh, production um at the same time a lot of people were trying to like cash in on that hype and trying to cash in on 360 video making a lot of bad 360 video stuff so at a certain point no one really liked it anymore so we kind of moved on to like really six dof vr uh, and, uh, like facebook uh, oculus they did that of course with the oculus quest one and two that are completely six off so you can like move around which which makes it makes it impossible to use 360 video because that's a camera that's somewhere you know it's stuck there so so i think if you are like games became more and more important um i actually think it's a pity because i think 360 vr can be really beautiful and good um and i think a lot of talented people like myself are moving away from it now while we actually now know how to do it well which i really think we do it ourselves a disservice with that um but um um well new i think also our our kind of people are pioneers you know we like to do stuff with new stuff so i for example moved on to um, volumetric video i'm in a very luxurious position to be um, the in-house director for the for the 40r studios in eindhoven which is the, the, the only full volumetric capture studio in the, in the Benelux, like in Holland, Belgium, and uh, uh, Luxembourg. I think there's one in England, there's one in Germany, there's one in France. You know, those are like very like rare studios still. Um, and, and I really love volumetric video. Why? Because I can film a real actor with real emotion, with real expressions but place him in a game engine. So I can have six dof, I can look around, I can like move around in that space and be with real actors. Like to go back to what I said in, in, the, in the beginning, like I, I think 3D is great, but not as cool as real humans, you know, like and real things. I love, the more I do VR, the more I love reality. <laughs> Like again, let's look out of my window. Look, look at the the grass, like moving in the wind. That's like I'm never, I will never be able to make a virtual reality experience that is as cool as the, all of the grass that's growing there. But that's another topic. So, uh, so, so, so being able to use real actors and real like in in uh, 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 like in game engines and having interactivity is, I think, where I'm going. And, and what, what I really like, uh, I do that with a project called The Imaginary Friend, which is uh, a, a story about a young boy with, uh, uh, he has an anxiety disorder and he's also, and that has related, that has related to it, a very vivid imagination. And he has also a friend, namely you, the spectator, participant, player of the experience. And he, he, uh, you help him with overcoming his fears but do you really help him now because of you everyone thinks he's crazy so that's like i think the perfect vr story uh and i'm trying to make this one with volumetric video and it's going to be interactive volumetric video which actually doesn't exist yet so i think if i'm if i'm able to make it fast enough i will be like like making something again that no one ever saw um and uh uh so th this is where I see it going. But at the same time, I think VR is, everything we learn from VR is, is, is applicable in AR in some way. I think a lot of people agree with me that AR is probably going to be way bigger than VR because it's, uh, because it's much more practical. 
but I don't I never really compare VR and AR because I think it's all part of uh, a, a change that I think you could call like a spatial transition. Like now we are both looking at the square screen, something we developed the last century, which is a very efficient way of like changing information, like looking at films, working behind your computer. But in the couple of million years before the evolution made us humans that work inside of space like and i think it's not going to take long before you're going to have a pair of glasses and your laptop is going to be inside of your glasses and your screen is going to be in front of you above your desk until you realize wait a second i can have five screens behind each other and i can even put a cactus in between because it's much more cozy you know and then suddenly you realize wait a second i can move the cactus around i can move stuff in space so i feel that's a that's the big thing we're doing and i think vr ar xr whatever you call it is all part of of that change in of interface how we're gonna uh interact with the digital world yeah really uh, inspiring and uh, prominent view on a on a perspective of a future i i feel something will exist yeah but can't articulate it, it uh, and uh, uh, yeah, there is a fear that we could be uh, yeah, more digitalized as in China and uh, tagged yeah, with uh, social ratings uh, or this kind of... Uh, yeah, well, so we have to be as artists, we have to make critical works. We need to make people conscious of, of what's, what's happening and, 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 uh, and, and, and make the, the best decision. Like technology has always been a double-edged sword. It is it is a superpower and it will destroy us you know like it's it's uh it, it's so yeah that, that's i think one of the main reasons as artists that's why we we need to make works that that make people conscious of the dangers and uh like i don't really like doing that because i like to be happy but i think it's a really important responsibility uh mm -hmm. because we mostly see it the most early as well because we are the ones who are going out there and trying it and and, and and, uh, and, 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 and first grasp what it all can do.